So if you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah, and uh, we have sung already, "'Tis so sweet." Now we're going to go back to the beginning. And so if you can turn to Zechariah, I'm going to give you some overviews first so that you can understand what the book is about. That's what we try to do. So over the last month or so, uh, and probably before that, I've tried to, to get an overview of the book so that we know where we are going. And so if you want to divide up the book of Zechariah, this is probably the easiest way. From chapters 1 through 6, we have eight visions. And all of these were received, believe it or not, in one night. We look at six chapters and think, well, may, maybe it would have been over a long period of time. No, he got these visions all in one night. And as you go through these visions, as we will over the next few weeks, you'll see how much of it seems to tie in with the book of Revelation. Then when we come to the latter part of the book from chapters 7 through 14, you have a number of messages. Some people divide it up into certain messages, but for the sake of a, a simple outline, we're going to consider 7 through 8 as Israel scattered and regathered, Israel restored in chapter 9 and 10. The tribulation relates very much to that in Zechariah 11, including you'll see that there is one who is pointed to as the Antichrist. And then chapters 12 and 13 is very much dealing with the end of the tribulation. And Zechariah 14 is dealing with the second coming of the Lord. We're talking about when he comes back at the end of the tribulation. We're not talking about the rapture. So immediately you will see how many things tie in as we go through that. And this is a very, very quick overview, but I want to show you how much does connect with Revelation. You have four horses, and you're going to see that in Zechariah 1, where we're going in a little while, chapter 6, you have that as well. And we will see tonight particularly, how does that relate to the four horses that you see in Revelation chapter 6. Then you've got the horns. Uh, which we find them mentioned also ties in with Revelation chapter 17, the, the ten horns, but it's four horns in this instance. You've got the measuring line. You find also in Revelation chapter 11, there is the measuring line, measuring the temple area. This measuring is a greater area than that. We'll find out what that's about. You've got the high priest. And what happens when you start in Revelation chapter 1? You see the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory and you see him in the high priestly garments. So that should be exciting to us. You've got the lampstand or the candlestick. You've got that in, in Revelation chapter 1. You've got the same thing here in Zechariah. You've got the two witnesses. And if you know Revelation at all, you know that there are two witnesses in Revelation and they have an important part and what we will see in Zechariah ties in with that. You have the scroll, you have the whore of Babylon, you have the worthless shepherd who is a, a picture of uh, the Antichrist and most of all from chapter 7 through to 14 you have the conquering king, our glorious saviour. So we've got those exciting things to look forward to and so I trust that Lord willing you'll enjoy this time we will continue with a few breaks with Easter and with a few other people preaching in between but we will not finish this probably until about the middle of next term so be encouraged we will go fairly swiftly but I hope it will be slow enough for you to take in the contents of Zechariah and to get an understanding of it I just want to go back to our very first screen there and uh, I want you to get a, a visual, if you can, from these visuals of the three visions that we will be considering in Zechariah, chapters 1 and 2. So we're going to be looking at the vision of the four horses, we're going to look at the vision of the four horns, and then we're going to look at the vision of the measuring line, and we'll find out what they are all about. And so without wasting any more time, not that what we did was a waste at all, it's helping you to understand and get into the book, 
We'll come now to Zechariah and chapter 1. If you are of a historical mind, which I remind you I am, but I consider others that are not so much in that way, as Zechariah is receiving these visions, the year is probably around about 521 BC. Israel has been taken as captive, Judah specifically, into Babylon. They've been there for 70 years, but now they are coming back. And they begin to build the temple. But the people are getting a bit discouraged, losing their focus. And so two men, two prophets are called by the Lord to build them up and stir their hearts. And that is Zechariah that we're looking at and Haggai. It's interesting that Haggai tells us that the problem that Israel had at this time, and Zechariah is, is ministering at the same time, the problem with the people is that they had got discouraged, they'd got defeated and they'd given up, they'd stopped building the temple and they focused, even as we read in the Word of God, on instead building their panelled houses. And there's nothing wrong if you have panels in your houses, but the thought is that they were neglecting the things of the Lord and they had forgotten the Lord and the importance of having a place to worship. And so they were stirred up again to look to the Lord. And in many ways, this is the context of, of Zechariah. And so... It took many days to, to build the temple. It took a long, long time. And uh, the message that is going to come out of this is that there needs to be a complete spiritual return of God's people. That's the historical context. And so this is during the time of the Persian Empire. But not long after this, within a few hundred years, Greece would take over and, and so on. So that's the background. And so therefore it will make sense to you as we start in, in verse 1 and we see there in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, straight away, we know this is a real man, a real person, because we've got his ancestry. This is not something that's made up. And so we're introduced to, to Zechariah. He is probably... A young man, because as we look at chapter 2 and verse 1, the young man that is referred to there, it seems to be Zechariah that the reference is regarding. So he's a young man and he receives these visions from the Lord. And we know when it is. It's in the second year of Darius, so it's the Persian Empire. And as we've said, around about 521 BC. And so here he is. And straight away, the, the message that he is receiving, which will go into the visions, is that the Lord is angry. The Lord is angry with, with Israel, and he's been angry with their fathers as well, because they themselves have started to turn away from the Lord. We'll pick up the message here, because this is the first part of what we'll look at before we get into the main first vision is that the Lord is calling them to repent. Look at these words here, and they are just as much for us today. Verse 2, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. The very reason that they were taken into captivity was because of their disobedience to God. And yet already this generation that had come back to rebuild the temple and then the wall had already begun to forget the Lord and how like our human nature that is. We forget the lessons from the past and before we know it, sometimes without even fully realising it, we wander away in our hearts from the Lord and the, the message is still true to us today, return. Repent. Look at verse 3. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, this is a, a mighty title of the Lord, Return to me. Return to me. And how much we need that message in our age today. Return to the Lord. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Isn't that interesting? The message is, Return to me, and then I will return to you. 
Somebody has said this, and I remember it many years ago, that God is a gentleman. He doesn't force us to repent, but he wants us to. And as soon as we return to him, he returns to us, just like the prodigal son. When he made that decision to return to his father, the father was rushing there to meet him. What a message we need to hear. Verse 4. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me. They didn't take notice of me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, the word of God therein, which I commanded my servants the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. So the scripture is showing that the fathers learned the lessons even though they had rejected the Lord and the same message was there to, to Judah, to Israel. Return to me. Don't forget the lessons of the past. And the same message is true to us today. What a sad state our nation is in. The word of God rejected. The word of God forgotten. The foundations of our society built on the word of God is forgotten. And we're in a sad state because in forgetting God, there is not a repentant heart over our sin. So then we come to the vision of the four forces here. And this relates to what has just happened. Zechariah has introduced himself there in verse 1. And the message that he is giving introduces the visions. But there are a few months before these visions are received all in that one night. And so let's pick this up in verse 7. It says, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet. So here, he's going to receive the vision, and it's going to involve many visions. And it says there, I saw by night... And behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses red, sorrel, and white. We'll go into more detail, and we'll quickly cross-reference to Revelation. But if you know Revelation chapter 6, you know that there were four horses. Can you remember what the colours were? You had... Starting off with white, and then you have black, and then you have the pale horse, and then and you've got the red horse. So somebody's got it right. There you go. So isn't it interesting here, what you see is there are two red horses. There's a sorrel, which can be, be like a speckled, multicoloured horse, and there is a white horse. There is no... Black horse, but obviously they are going to tie in together, which we'll see in a moment. They're among the myrtle trees. Myrtle uh, is, is a tree that doesn't grow uh, too high. It is a fragrant tree. It is often speaking of, of being crushed and fragrance coming out. And so in many ways what we're seeing here is the Lord is telling Israel and warning them that there will be war that will come if they reject the Lord again. There will be war that will come. And we know that in the world's rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is war coming. The great war to end all wars. But praise the Lord, we believe from Revelation, the end of uh, uh, well, the beginning of chapter 4 and also in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the Lord will take away his church 
to be with him before that war comes. And so it's interesting, isn't it? You have this here. You see the horses that are mentioned. You have the various colours, but there is two red horses. Why would this be? I think personally, as we look at Zechariah, we, we need to see that although much of it was fulfilled historically, as with most of the prophetic books, there is usually a double prophecy regarding it. And you'll see that it is quite obvious as we go through this that some of these things have never been fulfilled. So therefore, there must be some future aspect to it. And this is what we're going to focus on primarily, the future aspect of it. And so excuse me if I do not go too much into the historical area. And so you see the, the horses mentioned there. You see the, the two red, the sorrel and the white. It says there in verse 9, Then I said, My Lord, what are these? And so the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. Now we believe as we go through this, the one, the angel is identified as the angel of the Lord. And if you've done any study of scripture, you'll know that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord is a title of the pre-incarnate Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ did not begin at Bethlehem. He's always existed and in the Old Testament, not saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is an angel, but there is a title that is given to him as the pre-incarnate Christ, as the angel of the Lord. And so we believe in studying through this that the man that is referred to here is the pre-incarnate Christ. And I believe it's then looking forward in the future to the Lord Jesus Christ being engaged particularly in the tribulation time, as the high priest interceding, as the judge at that time, and then as, as the victor as well. And so it says in verse 10, And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees, notice this one is clearly identified as the angel of the Lord and it seems that he is on the first red horse who stood among the myrtle trees and said, We walk to and fro throughout the earth and behold all the earth is resting quietly. Let's see whether we can bring some of this together. And so it is giving us an explanation of what these four horses mean you see that there, that these four horses are those who walk to and fro throughout the earth and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. And I think the thought is that at this particular time, when this was written, the earth was resting quietly in many respects. But it's a warning that as these horses go to and fro, that one day war will come. And I've got a, a point there, F, but before I come to that, I want to jump ahead so that you can see that there is a connection, I believe, between the four horses here in Zechariah and the four horses that are in Revelation. Now, if you were to go to Revelation, you can if you like. We have looked at Revelation the year before last, if you would like to watch those messages, they are online. But as we have gone through the book of Revelation, we clearly saw that when we came to Revelation chapter 6, that is the beginning of the tribulation time. And I believe the seven seals, which is what the four horses are a part of, the seven seals judgments are those which happen particularly in the first half of the tribulation because it is a revealing it is obviously in chronological order because otherwise it does not make sense and you cannot interpret revelation if you don't understand that how does Zechariah connect with that well it's not so much in chronically in chronological order there is some chronology because how does the book end it ends with the Lord Jesus Christ as victor at the end of the tribulation as the one who will be ruler of all going into the millennium. Now, we have clearly identified, and, and most that are pre-trib, pre-millennial would agree with this, 
that when you come to the four horses, it is showing what will happen, particularly in the first half, the beginning of the tribulation time, particularly in those first three and a half years. And it starts off with, with a horse, a white horse, and that white horse has a bow but no arrow. And generally we interpret this as a picture of the Antichrist, according to Daniel 9, as we cross-reference that, who will make a peace treaty with Israel. So all of a sudden, the war and the conflict that we see in Israel and, and we believe that uh, surely things can't go on too much longer. But if the conflict continues, eventually the Lord will take us home to be with him. But eventually the only peace that will come, which will be a false peace, is that the Antichrist will make a peace treaty with Israel. Finally, sort out the problems. So the white horse speaks of the Antichrist. It's not the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll get confused if you, if you put him there. The Lord Jesus Christ comes on a white horse in Revelation chapter 19 and he comes to conquer and he comes to rule. Very, very different. And the white horse, the one on the white horse, is clearly identified there as the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what I believe. I would not be 100% dogmatic on this, but this is what fits within the framework of the scripture. So you start off with the Antichrist being, bringing a peace treaty, but very soon after that, what do you come to? You come to the red horse, and the Bible clearly identifies that red horse as war. So the peace is very short, and there's going to be war, and so many people will perish at that time, the first half of the tribulation, and then even more so in the last half. And then you come to the black horse and it tells us that uh, that means famine. There's going to be famine across the world. And then you come to the pale horse, which means death. And so how does this connect then with what we've seen in Zechariah? If you can go back there. It's interesting, isn't it? How does it start there in Zechariah with what we've looked at? What's the first horse? It's red. What's the second horse? It's red. So I believe if we were to say that this has some future aspect, the focus as far as the Lord is concerned here in Zechariah is it's all about war because the Lord is coming to judge. And then as you continue on, perhaps the sorrel horse is equal to the, the pale horse, which means death because there will be death, but you end off with the white horse. And I believe that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in this instance in order because he is the one who will come to bring the true peace. So this is just an application. I believe it could tie in with this. But also these things tied in historically at that particular time. War would come. But then there would be peace. But war would come. There would be famine. There would be death. And so that was true. So some see Zechariah as one of the, the most uh, complicated prophetic books, and I didn't want to tell you that because I want you to stay with me. But I believe as we compare it to other scriptures, we will understand it because the Bible is an integrated whole. It all ties in together. There's a reason that the things that are mentioned here are similar to Revelation. God is behind all these things, so there must be a connection. That's what we need to see. So we've done very well tonight already because we've looked at the first vision and we've, we've seen what it's all about. But basically, ultimately, is regarding how the, the Lord will swiftly judge Israel at that time as he did because of their lack of repentance, but he will swiftly judge again in the first half of the tribulation also. So I said I would go back to, to the last point. Uh, we've got it there as F. And I want us to see this because I dare not miss out on this passage because it is so relevant to today. So as you look there at Zechariah chapter 1, and we are going to read through from 12 through 17, I want you to see with me that this has to be looking at more than just Jerusalem back there. Yes, Israel did rebuild the temple. Yes, they resettled the city. Yes, they put a wall around the city. 
But what we're going to see in these verses, it goes beyond that. There are some things that are mentioned here that have not yet been fulfilled. And so let's read through this. Let's understand this uh, the best way that we can. So we look there at verse 12. It says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you were angry these 70 years? Remember, they've been in captivity for 70 years. The question is asked, how long will you not have mercy? Well, the Lord showed them mercy for hundreds of years, but eventually they were taken away under Rome in 70 AD. Eventually they were taken away. And so the same thing could be said today. If you go to Israel, most of those in Israel, uh, the Jews, do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't know the Messiah. And in many respects, it would seem to them that they do not have mercy. I remember speaking to our Jewish guide many years ago when we were there. And the grief that he felt, even though he was a secular Jew, how that if there was a God... It was confusing to him how that God seemed to punish them as a, as a people and as a nation over and over and over again. And the same question can be asked, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? Jerusalem has continued to be a place of conflict for hundreds of years. And on the cities of Judah against which you were angry. And so it seems to the Jew today that if there is a God, that he is angry with them. And the Lord answered, it says there in verse 13, the angel who talked with me, with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm zealous for Jerusalem, and I don't think you can ever take that away. The Lord is still zealous for Jerusalem. Israel do not know him as a majority but he still is concerned for them and we need to remember that the Jews are unsaved they don't know the Lord and so if we judge the Jews we are judging them as unsaved but it doesn't take away the fact that God has a plan for them because this plan obviously is not only for back then but it is still obviously for future Otherwise, God would break his promises if he did not still fulfill the future that it is implied here. I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. It's interesting there when it says the, the nations at ease, it means the nations feel secure. Easy for them to judge Jerusalem. Easy for them to judge Israel. And it says the nations that are at ease, the nations that feel secure. And I think about that, that's relevant today, isn't it? The nations in many ways feel secure in what they are doing. They feel secure in what they're doing. They go their own way and think that they can do what they want. But notice what it continues to say, verse 15. For I was a little angry. And notice this, they helped. In other words, the nations, they helped but with evil intent. Doesn't that seem to be the way it is today in the midst of the confusion of what is happening in the Middle East? You wonder how much real intent there is to help. It seems like they want to help. But is it true intent here it says evil intent this was true back then and i believe it's true now therefore thus says the lord i'm returning to jerusalem with mercy my house shall be built in it we know that that has been, been fulfilled the temple was rebuilt again but i believe it's looking beyond to that time where we know from ezekiel chapter 40 through 48 there will be the temple that will be there in the kingdom of God, in, in the Lord's kingdom. So look at what it is saying there, verse 16. I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. I believe that is still true. I believe that there is still mercy for 
for Israel, still mercy for Jerusalem. And we see as we study the scriptures in many parts that at the end of the tribulation that the nation of Israel will finally repent and as a nation they will all turn to the Lord. And we will deal with this later on when we come to towards the end of Zechariah. It's very, very clear that they will repent as a nation, yet it is still future. It's still future. They'll repent as a nation and they'll return to the Lord. So my house shall be built, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. This, the idea of measuring and, and surveying is, is to show that there is interest and there is still purpose. If I get out a measuring tape, which we've got to do for our doors over at the manse, it shows that I've got some interest. I'm engaged with, with what is actually there in front of me. And so I believe what we're seeing here is, is that the Lord is engaged, he's interested back then but still now in Jerusalem, in Israel. Verse 17, again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. I believe much of that. Some of that was fulfilled, but much of that is still future. So I say to us, how can we argue against this? Because all of this has not been directly fulfilled, so there is obviously still some future purpose Yes, Israel as a nation is rejecting the Lord, but one day, because the Lord has never forgotten them, they will turn to the Lord. Do we believe the promises of God's word or not? And so we come now to the vision of the horns. And already I feel like I'm, I'm losing time, but we will we'll look at these and we will try to make some applications as quickly as we can. And I know that you're engaged with this and excited how that it is relevant to today and to the future. And so we have there the vision of the horns. Now, the horns are often used in the scripture to speak of power and particularly to speak of Gentile nations. And uh, why would it use horns? Well, horns are something that you want to avoid if you have animals with horns because the powerful creature behind those horns gives you quite a nasty bump and I found that out sometimes with some of our rams. You avoided the horns more than anything else. So the horns speak of, of power and it's interesting in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 24 as we go back to Daniel you, you see there that clearly the horns are identified as, as powerful nations. So that this is what the horns are referring to. And in, in Daniel chapter 2, remember that metallic image that you have there. You have four major powerful kingdoms identified, remember? Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. And we're going to see, I believe, that the four horns represented here are the same. They are the same. And then you come to Daniel chapter 7 and you have these four creatures, the same thing identified with those four nations. And so what I believe we're seeing here is it's recognising how that these nations would come against Israel, but remember it ends in Rome and that which comes out of Rome, which I believe we see in our current age. So it's giving a, a history of the world in many respects in the vision of the horns. So let's look at this in verse 18. Then I raised, this is chapter 1, verse 18. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? So he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Babylon. And then Persia. And then ultimately it would be Greece that would do the same thing. And then Rome and so on. Scattered, scattered, scattered. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, or some people would say artisans. And I said, what are these coming to do? 
So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head. But the craftsmen, interesting phrase there, notice that, are coming to terrify them. To cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah. A cross-reference Daniel 2.45, which I'm going to just look at in reference in a moment. Can you see what it is saying there? You had the four horns which represent the powerful nations that would cause Israel to be scattered. But then you had these craftsmen that come to terrify each of these nations. Out of the horns come the craftsmen. And I believe the picture that you have is you, you see these mighty nations that it would have been thought at the time they would never fall. Imagine being King Nebuchadnezzar looking at his great kingdom, his, his all-powerful kingdom. He would have thought that it never would have fallen, but within two generations from himself, it was completely gone. The same for Persia. And speaking of the craftsmen that come along, the craftsmen in this case to destroy Babylon was Persia. Persia, this mighty kingdom. I don't think we realise how extensive it was all the way across to Afghanistan and, and all the way across to Greece and down to Egypt, this mighty nation. If you'd been there at this time, even as Zechariah was, you'd think, well, how on earth would this ever be destroyed? But there was a craftsman that came along and that was Greece and destroyed Persia. And then there was another craftsman that came along Rome and destroyed Greece. And then finally there is one craftsman, according to Daniel in 45, that would come along and destroy all that, and that is the stone, the living stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what it is showing us is ultimately all will bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ and he will become the ultimate king, the government, the only one. That's the message that is there when you consider the four horns. And so the craftsmen are coming to terrify the nations, but it's talking about the destruction one after another. But finally, the Lord Jesus Christ in victory will deal with all. It's exciting when you think about that. This is a theme that is throughout Scripture reminding us over and over again throughout the Old Testament and then particularly in some books in the New Testament showing ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ will be king over all. And so we come to the final vision and then we, we have some thoughts to close off with it. But it's, it's a, the vision of the measuring line. And I've somewhat told you what this relates to, but we're going to go over it and you'll see it with your own eyes in the scripture so that you can see we're going verse by verse. It says there in verse 1 of chapter 2, Then I raised my eyes and looked, and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. So I said, where are you going? And he said to me to measure Jerusalem to see what is its width and what is its length. Some people, as I've said, take this to be Zechariah as the young man, but he has the measuring line. He's there to measure, identify Jerusalem. The focus is there on Jerusalem. As I said, I believe it's showing that God will never forget Jerusalem. He will never forget Israel. It was through Israel the Lord Jesus Christ came. It was through Israel that the promises were given to initially. And those promises would never be taken away. And it says there in verse 3, And there was the angel who talked with me going out. And another angel was coming out to meet him, who said to me, said to him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls because of the multitude of men and livestock in it. I don't believe we've ever seen Jerusalem like that. It had some walls built around it, but it's never been a place of peace. But it is telling us one day, and this is yet future, that Jerusalem will be without walls. In other words, in absolute peace. And that will only happen when the Prince of Peace will rule. 
For I, says the Lord, verse 5, will be a wall of fire around her. It doesn't mean in judgment, it means a wall of fire for protection. We know in certain parts of the world today, you put, uh, if you want to protect your animals, you might put some bushes around. If, if you really want to protect them, you light some fires because the wild animals don't like the fires. And so the same thought here is that the Lord is saying, I'm going to be a wall of fire around her. I'm going to protect her. And I will notice be the glory in her midst. That is still a future promise. That it's once again, it shows that God hasn't forgotten Israel. This is what this is all about. And we've already referred to, to Revelation chapter 11 where there is another man measuring the, the temple area, showing that God is still, still concerned for these things in the future. Yes, the temple will be rebuilt in the tribulation time, but that will be destroyed and ultimately there will be Ezekiel's temple. And so... There is an application for us as we, as we close tonight and we're going to finish off verse by verse, the last chapter. And there is some that was fulfilled historically. There are some things that relate to the history of the time. But once again, I believe you will see that it goes beyond that. We pick it up there in verse 6. It says there, Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. For I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. Some people believe that this is referring to Babylon. There are some aspects of that. But it's interesting if you study the scripture, particularly in Revelation 17 and 18, Babylon is always a picture of that which is against God. The evil against God. The rebellion against God. Right from the very start with the, the Tower of Babel or Babylon. We could put it that way. And so it's saying there, flee, flee. And the same thing, if Babylon represents that which is evil of this world, we are not to be a part of that, not to be identified with that. We have to live in this world. We have to, to care for and reach out to people, but we're not to take on the, the filth of this world, so to speak. It says, up Zion, verse 7, escape you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, he sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you, notice, touches the apple of his eye. And I do not think that that has changed. The apple of your eye is, is the sensitive part of your eye, the very most sensitive part of your eye. And so it is showing us that it's the part that we want to protect. Because if you don't protect that part of your eye, you'll soon know about it. You'll have lots of tears. And it's showing us, therefore, that the Lord still considers Israel, I believe, to be the apple of his eye. He hasn't forgotten them. They have forgotten him. They have not returned to him. But as soon as they do, he will return to them. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Verse 10, Since, or Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. There is some aspects of that that was fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ came as a man. But it has not all been completely fulfilled because he is no longer dwelling in their midst. But one day, he will. Many nations, notice, it's other nations that will be blessed because of Israel and the Lord working through them. Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Just an interesting clue, the way that we translate it into English, those days, that day, this day, the day of the Lord, usually is a clue to us that what is being referred to is something that is future from the historical time that it was written. And so it is telling us in that day, in the future, they shall become my people. They're not now. And I will dwell in your midst. And it is true of us as the church as well, as believers. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts, the mighty one, has sent me to you. And the Lord will take possession of Judah as his inheritance in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem, again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh. 
before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. And I say to you, the day is coming, and I believe it is very soon, that he will be aroused from his holy habitation after the rapture, and the world will go through that time of terrible judgment that if we believe the word, it is true, it's described in Revelation, the Lord will come out of his holy habitation and he will intercede in a way that he hasn't done before. That's why it's referred to as the day of the Lord. It's not that the Lord isn't working now, but he will intercede directly and people will know that it is God who is bringing that judgment and you see that from the book of Revelation. Exciting book. There's much for us to learn and there's much that we will see over and over again connects with the book of Revelation. What is the lesson for you and I as we think about this? Turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. Never forget that the Lord is always working. Never forget that he keeps his promises. And so therefore, that is why I support Israel. I do not support the fact that they don't know the Lord, and I recognise that, but I support Israel because I know that God still has a plan for them, but I recognise that they don't know the Lord. But we know that ultimately God still has a plan for them, and eventually they will come to the Lord. And I know we can get into all the politics of everything that is there. And I want you to think beyond what Israel represents now. God has not forsaken them, but they're not going to be perfect in what they do because they don't know the Lord. But if we believe the Bible, there is coming a time where God will clearly work with them again. And in the end, the whole nation will come to know the Lord at the end of the tribulation time. Do we believe God's word? Well, if we believe it and take it as it is written, that's what the Bible is pointing to. And so when we pray for Israel, really, and when we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we're praying beyond what we see now. We're praying for the Lord to come back for us at the rapture. We're praying that the Lord will will judge the world to reconcile the world unto himself. We're praying that the Lord will come back to rule and reign and then and only then will there be peace in Jerusalem. That's what we're praying about. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. So Lord, some of the things that we've looked at tonight may be new to us. Some of the things we may not have connected them before. And so, Lord, I would ask, we do not know all, we do not understand all, but I pray that we will consider what is in your word because we believe it to be true. It is true in in every other sense. We know that uh, your prophecies have been fulfilled, many of them already. So therefore, if prophecies have been fulfilled, those that are yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled in a true way. So help us to come, Lord, to your word in this way, recognising, recognising that your word is true. And that you haven't forsaken or forgotten Israel, nor have you forsaken and forgotten believers as well. And so therefore, it ties in together. We know, Lord, that you will be, you are a fire around us of protection and comfort. And one day, Lord, you will take us before that tribulation time on earth. So continue to speak to us through these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you.